Welcome to MHS. Congratulations! MHS stands for Morgan Haroon Sachs, which is the world's number one pretend finance company. Come with me. You will go through our Financial Analyst Training Program Boot Camp. Here you will learn a lot about finance and investing with no theory. You will rotate through the many divisions of our firm and we will discuss how to excel in 14 different financial analyst roles. I will also help you understand which finance role you're most passionate about and how to get hired and promoted in the industry. You will deal with the employees and clients of our firm in edutaining, meaning entertaining and educational interactive case studies, including how an IPO works, how to manage risk, and how to manage a portfolio. You will create incredible investment research reports that will impress the heck out of anyone in the finance industry. This course is for anyone who wants to be a financial analyst or a better investor, stock picker, portfolio manager, and more. No prior experience is necessary. It includes a comprehensive Excel template to help guide you through our training program. In addition, I will teach you Excel skills so you can model financial statements and value companies from scratch. This course is based on my many years of experience. I'm an MBA graduate from Columbia University. I've gone through the Global New Hire Financial Analyst Training Program at Goldman Sachs in New York, London, and Tokyo. I've worked for top hedge funds, and I even started my own hedge fund and venture capital firms. This course is more than 22 hours long. This is the most thorough financial analyst and investing course available on the market. The student reviews have been amazing. Welcome to the Morgan Rune Sachs training program. This will be a lot of fun. I'll see you in the morning. Welcome to our 228th weekly webcast. Now, if this is the first time you're joining us, welcome. If you've been with us before, welcome back. And so the way this call works is this is an AMA, kind of like you see on Reddit. You can ask me anything. You can ask me business questions, career questions, investing questions, any questions you want to take your career or your company to the next level. So without further ado, let's begin and please keep typing your questions. Thank you. I feel good today, man. All right, uh, let me kick it off uh, with Dewan who wrote, uh, hello, Chris. Hey, do you still think it's viable to invest in the S&P 500 for the long run with the US debt issue dollar, losing value over time, et cetera? Yeah, I still do. It's all relative. Investing is relative. One investment is better than the other. And the best investments, I think, when it comes to investing in countries are countries that are very capitalist, and democracies as well. Capitalism works. And so the very last entity in the world to go bankrupt would be the US government. I know there's debt issues and whatnot, and don't worry about that. Historically, whenever a first world country's debt has been downgraded, one year later, the markets are higher. I have precedence with the United States, Canada, and Japan. The best way to invest in the United States is by buying the VOO, ticker VOO. And let me show you that really quickly. And the fees are extraordinarily low. Never buy uh, mutual funds, please, because they're a ripoff. What I want you to do instead is I want you to buy ETFs. So let's go to finance.yahoo.com. Never pay for any website that's going to give you investment advice at all. That's me buying time while this loads. Here we go. <laughs> so I'm going to type in the VU here. If you're not sure where to put your money, I'll tell you what I do at least. And do your own research as always, please. Whenever I'm not sure where to put my money, I put it in the VU. Okay. The expense ratio is quite low, and this is very liquid as well. Um, and you never want to invest in illiquid stocks, meaning stocks with low daily volume, because illiquid stocks own you in a down market and not vice versa. If we click here on holdings, you'll see the 12 categories that represent the U.S. economy right here. The largest being technology at 27%. This was about 23% at the beginning of this year. It's gone up because tech stocks have had a dead cap bounce. They were down a bunch last year, as we all know. In terms of the largest uh, holdings, it's no surprise most are tech companies, all tech, 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 car tech, and then an insurance company. Berkshire has 28% other holdings in insurance. Okay, so I, I do think that in the long run, the VU is, is a great investment. Now, if you want to look at other ETFs globally, my favorite economy 
in the long run by far, and I've said this before multiple times, is Singapore. And I mention that because a lot of international companies that had their headquarters in Hong Kong have since thought about moving their headquarters somewhere else. Singapore is a great country to invest in longer term. Now, if you want to do research on ETFs, okay, exchange traded funds, what you can do is you can go to etf.db, that's ETF database, sorry, database.com, etfdb.com. And then right here, you can look at thousands of ETFs and do your own research as well. You can look by geography as well if you wanted to. So for example, if I wanted to invest in, let's say Brazil, I can invest in the EWZ or ticker EWZ right here, which represents the Brazilian economy. And of course, you can find them also for Singapore and every type of asset class. Now, please make sure that no more than 5% of any investment in your portfolio is in a single stock. It's good risk management and portfolio diversification. Now, if you're going to invest in cryptocurrencies, I don't want more than 5% of your liquid net worth to be in cryptos. And I don't want more than 0.5% to be in any one particular cryptocurrency. I don't care how good it sounds. We need regulation by the SEC on cryptos in order to make it more investable for the long term. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, next up, uh, Chitan wrote here. Hey, Chitan. Jatan wrote, uh, what are your views on First Republic and today's FOMC meeting? Yeah. So this morning, the FOMC, uh, which is uh, the government uh, agency, the Federal Open Market Committee, there's seven Fed governors and the Federal Reserve heads it up. Alexa, stop. I don't know why Alexa wanted to go off there, but anyway. Um, but the, the FOMC this morning, what they said is we have full confidence, basically. We have full confidence in our banking system. They have to say that. They have to. So, you know, it's just like if you're, I don't know, if you're, if you're interviewing the, the CEO of Nintendo, you know, the CEO of Nintendo is obviously going to say great things about their company in the long run. The FOMC represents U.S. economy, the country of the United States. So obviously they're going to say that. If they said the opposite, then people would panic. Now, this week, the Federal Reserve raised interest rates by 0.25%, which was expected, and they signaled to the marketplace that they might pause, meaning they won't be raising rates again this year. Now, the U.S. economy grew at about 1.1% in the first quarter, and it's now growing at about 0.5% year over year. And there's a 50-50 chance right now of a recession coming in the United States by the end of this year. The markets know that. The markets tend to discount what's happening six months from now. So a recession is defined as two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. I don't know. I think maybe we'll go slightly negative in Q4 and then have a nice bounce back. You know, if you look at the unemployment rate in the United States, it's still robust. And the problem with just looking at the unemployment rate in the United States is that what people don't realize, or I didn't until recently, is that 100,000 baby boomers retire every single week. And that means that 100,000 fewer people are looking for work. And the unemployment statistic represents people looking, actively looking for work. Yeah. Now, last thing I'll say in this topic is that the Federal Reserve and the U.S. government sees much more data, obviously, than we see. Uh, and as a result, I think they are a little bit worried, which is why they've stopped raising interest rates, or they will stop soon. Yeah. Okay. Now, in terms of First Republic in general, it's, it's unfortunate, but I think it was self-fulfilling. So here in Silicon Valley, where I live, there are two primary debt uh, financing banks that I worked with in the past. Number one, the most prestigious one was Silicon Valley Bank. Then after that, a close second, or maybe a distant second, is First Republic. And so it's shoot first, ask questions later. You know, investors were selling and shorting First Republic after what happened with Silicon Valley Bank. Now, what should you do with your money? Should you keep your money uh, in a mid-cap bank. Well, this morning, the Federal Reserve said, nothing to worry about here. However, if I use game theory, economics theory, and I hate theory, but I will now, the last companies to go belly up in the United States from a banking perspective would be the large cap banks, like JP Morgan, Citigroup, Morgan Stanley, et cetera, because they are too big to fail. And so personally, if I had to pick between a regional bank and a large bank, I would favor a larger bank. 
It's just better risk management, even if your monthly fees are a little bit higher. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, next up, Dares wrote, hey, first time I've seen you on the call. Hope, hope you join us again. Uh, wrote, um, hi, Chris. Um, how do oil families, meaning Saudis, hide their wealth uh, from the world? Yeah. <clears throat> so very wealthy people globally, uh, what they do is they all hire tax attorneys. And these tax attorneys cost about a thousand bucks an hour. It's ridiculous, but it's well worth it. Now, people like Warren Buffett pay less than 20% tax per year. And Warren Buffett has publicly disclosed that his assistant pays more in taxes percent-wise than he does. The 400 wealthiest families in the United States only pay 22% tax per year. They should be paying close to 40% tax, but they don't. Because they all hire these tax accountants that move their money around the world to make sure they don't pay as much tax. Now, the problem with the United States tax code, and I think it will change soon, is that you only pay taxes based on income you make or when there's capital gains. And so if we go back to 2007, Jeff Bezos, who was a billionaire many times over back then, not only did he not pay taxes that year, but he also got $4,000 for each of his four kids' dependents on his tax return back. And the reason is because he did not sell any Amazon shares. Now, I am a capitalist for sure. However, I don't think it's fair that billionaires don't pay taxes. I think no matter what, they should always be in the highest tax bracket. Yeah. Okay. And a lot of people will invest offshore. When I had my hedge fund years ago, I had what's called a master feeder structure. I had a domestic entity here in the United States uh, and it fed into my main hedge fund. And I had an offshore uh, bank that I owned in the British Virgin Islands that fed in as well to my master feeder. And I used the offshore part of, uh, and I did the Bur British Virgin Islands because it's cheaper than Caymans. I use the offshore component for my international investors like AB and Amro put five or six million uh, into my offshore account, for example. And they do it because they don't want to be subject to US taxes. Now, of course, you never give tax advice to anybody investing in your companies. And before you ever raise a penny from anybody, you hire lawyers first. And if you're not sure where to hire lawyers from, go to LegalZoom.com. Okay. All right, um, but I, I think that a lot of Saudi families, they, they understand uh, that, you know, oil will probably be relevant for the next couple decades and that's it. You know, in the United States, one of the byproducts of the, the war in Ukraine is that in the United States, in about a decade, it's gonna be against the law to buy gas powered cars in many states. And there's a very famous Saudi uh, Aramco executive uh, years ago, he said, that the stone age did not end because they ran out of stones. Okay, next up, uh, Abel, Abel uh, wrote, uh, hey, Chris, hope all is well, likewise. Uh, the Fed rose rates by 0.25%, that's 25 basis points yesterday. What does this mean for the housing market? Yeah, yeah, so you have to look at the yield curve closely, okay? So whenever you get a loan for your house, it's usually based on the 30-year rate. So let's take a look together in real time to see what's happened to the 30-year yield curve. Okay, and this is how the market prices debt. So what we're going to do is we're going to go together to treasury.gov. Whoops, hold on a second. Treasury.gov. Okay, then we're going to go here to data. And then we'll look here at the par yield curve rates. Okay, here we go. Let me make sure it's working. Okay, good. All right. So what I'll do is let's look at, uh, actually for fun, what I'm going to do is the start of the year, and we'll look at today's data in a second. But at the start of the year, the one month rate was 4.17. And the 30 year right here was 3.88. So when you have rates that are lower in the future than they are today, it means that the market is predicting a recession. Why? Because if rates are lower in the future, it means that the government is gonna to have to cut rates in order to stimulate the economy. And in almost all cases historically, if you run a regression analysis, a lower 30 year versus the current month, meaning lower, meaning an inverted yield curve means we're most likely going to recession at some point. So the market has priced this in. Okay, so let's go down now to the most recent data right here. So as you can see right here, the data, the 30 year came down a little bit this week. 
right? Actually, it went from this down to here because a lot of people are anticipating that, hey, the government is not going to be raising rates as much as possible. So in terms of your question on buying a house, financing your house, the 30-year, might become a little bit cheaper, okay? However, you also have to look at prices closely. And the three most important factors when it comes to real estate are location, location, location. Go to Zillow.com and take a look at what the prices of houses or apartments are in the area where you want to buy because the last price or the last uh, uh, sold item uh, sets the going price for the next one, so to speak. Yeah. I didn't answer that question that great. Sorry. I'm doing my best. Okay. All right. Uh, Prashant, how are you from India? Uh, who's in my, my silver MBA? Great to see you. Uh, good to see you too. Okay. And then uh, Abel uh, wrote here, I mean, I'm your silver student. Thank you. Uh, and by the way, for those of you in my, my silver MBA program, uh, what I do is um, when this call is done uh, every Thursday at 10 a.m. Uh, my time Pacific time, there's a one hour Zoom for just silver MBA students. And to access that one hour call, just go to the first lecture uh, in the curriculum. Yeah. And to learn more about the Haroon MBA, you, you know my website. I'm not going to, not going to pitch it. Okay. All right. Um, you wrote here, does your Excel program help to get a job in finance or do you teach only basic Excel and you please go over uh, your Excel program? Yeah, absolutely. I teach everything and I mean everything in that Excel course. Now, you can buy that course on Udemy. You can buy it on my website. If you're already an MBA student, I'm going to show you how to get it for free. Now, not only do I explain literally every single icon in Excel, but I also explain how to program from scratch every single Thing you can possibly think about in Excel. It's in that course. Okay. So the way to access this, and I'll make this quick. I don't want to be in sales mode. Just go to my website, harunmba.com. Okay. Uh, and then click right here on MBA curriculum search. And right here, you, you can just type in anything you want to look for in, in the curriculum. And I want you to click right here so that you can access the silver or pardon me, the, the Excel part of, of, of the curriculum. I teach you literally everything. I teach you how to program as, as, as well from scratch. Okay, let me pause this so that I don't consume bandwidth. Let me get back to questions. Yeah. And I was a programmer years ago uh, when I worked at, at Accenture. Yeah. I still code on the side. I love it. Oh, and I'm coming out actually later this year or early next year with a Python course as well. But I'm going to teach it in a different way with a lot of, a lot of props and really explain object-oriented in a simplistic way, kind of like I do in that Excel course, okay? And if you meet me in real life, I'm a tiny man. I'm, I'm really, really small. Okay. okay. All right, next up, Manas from India, who wrote, uh, good morning, dear mentor. Chris, please, great to see you. Uh, hope all is well. Uh, what a wonderful day as always. Uh, it is. A little, little bit rainy here today, but it's good. Um, you wrote, how is the wind in your side? A lot of stuff happening at the same time. Uh, so, so let's, let's begin. Oh, the weather is, is decent. I'll, I'll show you my studio here. So, um, it's, it's a little bit cloudy. It was raining earlier, but this is, uh, this is my office. Yeah. And it's a separate entrance, uh, from, from my house. I, I keep it separate, my, my studio down here. And that's a extra wide angle lens, kind of a messy desk. I got this massive desk here cause I thought I'd, I'd be neater, but there's just more stuff on it. Yeah. All right. It's good to see you. Okay, uh, next up, Jamba. Hey, Jamba. First time I've seen you on the call. I hope you join us again. Jamba wrote, uh, please talk about the BRICS uh, and the viability of the U.S. dollar if Saudi moves uh, from the oil dollar. Yeah, so Saudi Arabia um, is talking, has been talking for quite a while now, uh, about instead of selling uh, crude uh, in U.S. dollars, they're going to use the Chinese currency, which is the one or also called the renminbi. Um, and they're doing this uh, as a way to take their reliance off the United States. Now, I still believe that the United States dollar will be the reserve currency of the world for the next 30 to 50 years. However, there's a very small change going on in the world now where there's chatter of adopting the Chinese yuan, which is only sustainable if the Chinese economy doesn't continue to move towards the left. Now, I've started to uh, invest more in gold, and I think gold is a great asset class. And do your research. This is fake, just like me, I'm a fake teacher. Do your research, but you can always type in ticker GLD in order to buy gold. Now, one of the reasons I think that cryptos and gold have been better investments recently is because the Chinese government 
is likely going to be buying less U.S. dollars. And what do they do with their money then? Well, they're probably going to buy gold. It's safe. Also, India is now the world's largest country in the world. They just passed China population-wise. And in India, the gold market is red hot. It always is. So I'm bullish on this long, longer term. Yeah. All right. All right, next up, the Berlin, who's from San Bernardino, California. Uh, good to see you. And in two weeks, I'm going down to Hollywood for uh, uh, for three or four days. I'm renting a couple of studios to film some videos. I can't wait to show you close to where you live. You are, I hope you had a fantastic week so far. Thank you, likewise. Okay, uh, uh, next up, uh, and the same producer uh, that, that produced that, that video you saw at the beginning today, where I have Morgan Haroon Sachs, which is the world's, a very long and not so rich history since 2017. The same producer who's Adad Warda is going to be producing this unbelievable trailer that, that I'm making. We're calling it our Super Bowl commercial. Yeah, it's a big investment, but it's worth it. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, next up, Manas wrote, uh, uh, the former Fed chairman Alan Greenspan uh, said the U.S. would never default its debt because all of it is in dollars so they can print as much as possible. How far is this true and for how long? Yeah, it matters so long as other countries continue to buy U.S. debt. And as of now, and I think it'll be this way for several decades, the lowest risk investment in the world, the last company to go bankrupt, is U.S. government. And you'll know this is not the case if in schools and on Wall Street, when they use the risk-free rate to calculate the cost of capital, they stop using the three-month U.S. Treasury and start using the one, which I don't think is going to happen ever. And, and many years ago, instead of the U.S. dollar, a lot of international investors used a basket of currencies called LIBOR, which stands for London Interbank Offer Rate. That's not as popular now as it once was. Yeah. Now, Alan Greenspan, when I worked actually at, uh, uh, when I worked at Citadel Big Hedge Fund, um, we had this annual forced family fun event on weekends in, in, in Chicago every year. <clears throat> it was actually a lot of fun. And what Ken Griffin did, um, uh, who's the, the billionaire founder, is he brought in Alan Greenspan to give uh, the keynote. <clears throat> and Greenspan said something fascinating. He said, the reason why we had unprecedented economic growth and irrational exuberance in the 1990s was not because of technology stocks. It was because the Berlin Wall fell in 1989. And when the Berlin Wall fell, what happened was you had all this brilliant and cheaper Eastern European labor moving west. And the biggest input into all things you make in inflation is the price of labor. And I wrote an article in 2013 in Wired Magazine and Venture Beat Online uh, where I talked about this generation's Berlin Wall teardown event is Amazon Web Services. It has the same deflationary impact. And by the way, I just got my own column in Forbes magazine, just published my first article. You can go to my, my LinkedIn uh, profile to check it out. And thank you. Okay. All right, next up, uh, Irwan wrote, uh, hey, Chris, uh, hey, uh, I'm in the business of selling bioenergy-based therapy, uh, which is done remotely. I've been trying to scale up my business through the use of paid advertising, but failed. Uh, any tips? Yeah. It is really, really, really tough to use advertising online, okay? Um, don't do it if you want to sell, you know, $10 courses. You can only use advertising online if you have a, a product that's at least a couple hundred dollars, okay? And don't do it yourself, no matter what you do, because the algorithm changes all the time. Take it from me. I wasted thousands of dollars doing this in the past. I now work with uh, my CMO, who's Cassandra Cox. She's great from Cox Creative. And what she has done, she figured out an algorithm so that every $1 we spend on advertising, we make $8. You think, oh my God, Chris, that's scalable. You could be a billionaire. No, because it only, it's only based on people that search for certain topics. But anyway, hire somebody like uh, Cassandra. Go to coxcreative.com uh, to learn more. Yeah. And make sure you only sell a product that's at least a couple hundred dollars. And I find as much as I, I, I despise Facebook um, from a, a politics perspective and what they've done to, I don't know, widen the gap in terms of, of, of opinions here in America, I think it's still the best place for advertising. Yeah. Because you get a ton of data from them. Yeah. Okay. All right. Next up, uh, the Berlin wrote, uh, Chris, uh, the Fed went from saying uh, we're going to have a mild recession to we hope we have a mild recession. Yeah. That, that language is kind of scary. 
Uh, what are your thoughts when the Fed changes their way of speaking? Yeah, so every single word that the Fed states um, is scrutinized uh, by the investment community, okay? And, and the Fed releases their minutes, which is basically a script of what they said. And the second they release it, what analysts do, what I used to do, is we open up the current minutes in Word, Microsoft Word, and we open up the previous minutes in Word, and we do an auto-compare. And whenever the language changes from we are somewhat concerned to we are very concerned, people freak out. Now, earlier today, when I was talking about Greenspan, I talked about irrational exuberance. He used that language in a speech in like 96 or 97, and the markets freaked out temporarily. So I think this signals that the Federal Reserve thinks a recession is now a little bit more likely. Yeah. And, and you'd think intuitively that, hey, if the government says we're not going to raise rates anymore, the market would go up a lot. No, because people are now worried. What do they see that we don't know? You know, and usually you think that when rates are cut, markets go up and vice versa, but it all depends what market sentiment is. For example, in Q1 of 2020, when we were all you know, working from home for obvious reasons, uh, the Federal Reserve cut interest rates by 100 basis points. That's a nuclear cut <laughs> um, on a Sunday. And I remember the next day, my, my MBA program, my, my students were saying, Chris, you said that when the government cuts rates, you know, the market usually goes up. The market went down a lot. And it did because it was such a massive cut. People were thinking, what does the government see that we don't see? Yeah. But I think that small increase or small cuts is prudent. And I fault the U.S. government, um, Democrats and Republicans, and the Federal Reserve, historically, for not raising rates more when times were much better you know, in the years after 2010, when the markets were doing well. Because if you don't raise rates, then you can't cut rates enough to jumpstart the economy. Yeah. Which leads to inflation if rates are zero. Okay. All right, next up, Manas wrote here, and give me one second, guys. All right, hold on a second here. Okay. <clears throat> okay, uh, Manas wrote, uh, real estate is too expensive in your state or in the United States in general. It's difficult to get to get a debt and houses are 100% more expensive than the real value is. Is and that is this a bubble or will it rise more and more? Yeah. So my, my grandfather, God bless you, grandpa, I miss you and grandma too. My grandfather used to say, Chrissy, buy a land. They're not making it anymore. I think that land is still a great investment longer term. Now, I don't like investing in cities-based rents because I think in the future, more people are going to work from home. So I like farmland a lot. And you can buy acres and acres of land in Texas, and I've done this, where you buy the land, but you give up the mineral rights below it. I think buying property outside of cities is prudent. I don't even go into San Francisco anymore. That's another story. I don't want to go there. Yeah. I don't feel safe, actually. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, next up, we have uh, Radu from Romania. Great to see you. He's in my platinum program. Uh, you wrote, good morning, good evening, uh, and everything in between. Good to see you, man. Good to see you. Okay. Uh, and ne next up, Manas wrote, um, will it be difficult for average Americans to live if the dollar is not the reserve currency? Um, and how much, like for us, our rupee in India gets devalued more and more against the dollar? Uh, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah. I'm still bullish longer term on the U.S. economy. Every, when you invest, everything is relative. You know, one asset class versus another one. What's a safer asset class? I still think the U.S. economy is a great long-term investment. Now, don't listen to the media. Their job is to, is to get you to watch more. Like the, the media has to compete with eyeballs with, with tons of different form factors now. And they're using scare tactics. You know, you're watching CNN or Fox. I'll, I'll keep it bipartisan here. If you're watching CNN or Fox, you know, they'll say this. Find out why the United States economy is going to crash after this commercial break. Always do your own research. And just remember everything, everything is relative. Yeah. But I'm very bullish in India longer term. Yeah. And I think India has a better chance of being the world's reserve currency than China does in the long run. India is the biggest democracy. I, I love India. Okay. All right. Um, and I love China too. Okay. Uh, Mindy wrote, good morning. How are you? 
Okay, next up we have Kex. And Kex, I see you got a, a trophy icon. Thanks for supporting my channel. I appreciate it. We've been doing this for five years now. Cray cray. Yeah, but fun. So Kex wrote, uh, hi, Chris, can you offer some simple guidance in how to evaluate corporate actions or where to look online for discussions, such actions? I'm sure you cover this in your MBA program, which I'd like to do when time and money permits, uh, but not possible right now. I've read the 10K, which is the annual report, uh, tender offer statements and amendments, press release, et cetera, uh, but that seems very fishy. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so what I recommend doing is for any company that you follow, um, I want you to set up alerts. Okay, so what you can do is this. You can go to alerts.google.com. Type in the company name and your name as well if you want. And whenever there is news that comes out on that company or you or whatever, you'll get an automatic email. Now, if anybody is on this call and you're about to interview at a company, set up those alerts so that right before your interview, if there's any news on that company, you can talk about it. Now, when I worked in the hedge fund industry, I used to set up other alerts as well. Now, for some reason, the newspapers get a hall pass when it comes to insider information, and they never reveal their sources. I think the government lets them do it as long as they don't transact, of course. Now, what happens with newspapers is usually the journalists will say, they never re re reveal their sources, they'll say, according to people familiar with the matter, Microsoft is going to acquire whatever. So what I want you to do, and this is what I used to do, is I want you to, in Google with alerts, put this in. For the companies you follow. In quotes, according to people familiar with the matter, and then the company name. And whenever there is some sort of rumor, and if it's a good source, like a New York Times deal book, which is usually pretty accurate, or the Wall Street Journal or the FT, then that might help you with your portfolio. But think longer term always. Yeah. Never buy a company just because there's a rumor of a takeover. Yeah. But what but all companies have to release all material information at the same time through what's called an 8K which of course you can also get from sec.gov along with the 10K and the 10Qs. 10Qs being the quarterly reports. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, uh, next up, uh, Prashant wrote, uh, Chief, uh, do you think it's the right time to apply uh, for permanent residency for Canada from India? Uh, I'm looking at this, this opportunity. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I love Canada. I'm a very proud Canadian. I'm so bullish on India longer term. I mean, India just passed China in terms of the world's number one country population wise. Uh, and I think that GDP for India will one day pass the United States. I am so bullish on India. Yeah. But let me answer this question a different way. Uh, and I'll make it generic enough as always to apply to everybody in this call. Let's say you live in country X and your dream in life is to go to country Y. But it's hard to immigrate. How do you get to country Y? Well, what you can do is in your country, country X, you can join a company whose headquarters are in country Y. I'll give you an example. Let's say your dream is to live in the United States and you live in India, for example. You can work for Microsoft in India, for example, and climb the corporate ladder. And after five or 10 years, you gotta be long-term focused. When you get promoted to vice president or a senior position, it's natural that they're gonna ask you to move to the mother ship meaning to Redmond, Washington State, in the United States, in the Northwest. And they'll take care of all the visa stuff as well. Yeah. And that's what happened with me partially, with Goldman Sachs. They took care of all the visa stuff when I lived in Canada and they wanted me to move down to New York. Yeah. yeah. And then Goldman, when I, when I worked at Goldman, uh, they were so good, man, to me. Um, I, I love working there. They don't hire the smartest people, right? But uh, when I worked there, they, they had lawyers working around the clock to try to get me a green card myself and two of my other colleagues I worked with, um, uh, Andrew Warner and, and, and Wayne Edelist. And Wayne and Andrew got theirs, but I didn't get mine. And I'm convinced it's because of 9-11. So when I worked at Goldman, um, I was, after 9-11, because my, my last name, I was on this no-fly list. And it, it sucked, and, and I hated all this profiling crap. Um, but, you know, with me, I always, I always look at the positives. I looked at the pauses because I would go to, to JFK or LaGuardia and there'd be really long lineups in late 01, early 02. And, you know, just to, to get through security. I'd always go to the front of the line uh, and, and I'd say, hi, I'm on that list. And they're like, okay, cool. Come over here. We'll give you, you know, an extra pad down, all that stuff. And I, I got through fast. And I'd hang out in the first class lounge, just, you know, drinking a couple cool cool ones. I don't drink anymore, but I don't drink any less. Yeah. 
too much information. Okay. Um, and then Rob wrote, so Chris, do you believe in taxing unrealized gains? I do if you're a billionaire. I do. Because it's not fair that billionaires do not pay taxes. Many of them don't. I don't think that they should get... Uh, so for example, Jeff Bezos got 4,000 bucks back per kid. He had four kids. He got 16,000 bucks back in 2017 or 2007. I don't think he should be allowed to do that. Yeah. Okay. But I'm a big believer in small government. Yeah. All right. Hey, Claude. All right. Moving on to Dewan who wrote, uh, Chris, uh, I don't see my first question and I came a bit late. Uh, only if you have time. Oh, yeah. I think you posted it late last night. If you post something like 12 hours before, it gets stripped out. Also, there's certain keywords that people use that get stripped out. Um, uh, back in September, I don't know if you guys remember, there was a bunch of racist rants, which is just terrible. So I blocked a bunch of stuff, rightly so. Um, uh, and, and if you put a hyperlink in YouTube for some reason, you know, strips it out. I can't see it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you wrote, uh, only if you have time, I always have time. Uh, would you have a look at my LinkedIn profile? I used your advice to start posting about topics that interest me. Yeah, sure. Let's, let's do it right now. And what I'll do as always is I'll make my comments generic enough so that they can apply to any LinkedIn profile. Okay, great. Um, now, before I go there, just let me know, or while I go there, just type here in the chat, who am I supposed to be? As I read your LinkedIn profile, am I a CEO of a company that wants to hire you in what sector, for example? But I'll go there right now, and I'll give you a quick review. Okay. All righty. Link it in. And it's Dewan uh, Mueller. Okay. Of course, I've got Bueller, Bueller, Bueller in my head. Okay, is that the right one? Okay, let me know if this is you for sure. Okay, because um, I, I don't want to give advice if that's not you. Just put yes or, or no in the chat there. And I'll come back to this in a minute. Yeah. Okay. All right, next. Luca, how are you, man? Luca Anderson. Uh, earlier on, I was talking about that uh, that Python course. I'm partnering with with Luca uh, Anderson uh, to do it. Luca is one of my amazing Platinum MBA students. He's got 250,000 followers or, or students, I should say, uh, on Udemy. He's amazing at tech. He's flying here to uh, on June 1st. He's staying at my house from June 1st to June 7th, and we're gonna record a bunch of tech courses together. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really excited about it. Uh, Luca, I'm looking uh, forward to, to meeting you. Uh, Luca, uh, every, when every, time, when every time I see your name, I think of Star Wars. Luca Ennison, you have the most badass name ever. I'm six feet. Luca, I asked him how tall he is because we're specking out this, this, uh, the, the studio here so I can record both of us together. And I think you said you're six foot seven. So what I'm going to do, Luca, when you arrive, uh, this is my, my treadmill here I'm standing on. I'll probably stand in the treadmill and I'll have you stand here. And I will disclose you're way taller than me, though. Yeah, yeah. And I'm looking forward to meeting you, brother. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, okay. Okay, so Duan just wrote, yes, that is me. Okay, so let me go back to your LinkedIn profile. I'll give you a quick, um, a quick review here. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go down to the bottom of your LinkedIn profile to make sure that you don't follow any politicians. Okay. Um, now... I don't want anybody to follow politicians on LinkedIn or Twitter because half the people will like you more and the other half, you know what I'm getting at. So I'll go down to the bottom, we'll do a bottoms up analysis here. Okay, so I'm gonna look at the voices that you follow here. Tony Robbins, who I've met, really nice guy. When I met a man, his hand wrapped around mine like 8 million times, really good guy. He invests actually in one of my companies in, in, um, in venture capital. And when I had him come to uh, meet with one of the companies to invest in, in in San Francisco, he had a security guard there looking around with, with a wire, all that stuff. Yeah. But really good guy. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Luca wrote, I'm six, four to six, five. Okay, good. So th this, this, this little stepping stool for me will help that. All right. So I don't see any politicians. Good. Let me go to companies. Uh, again, let me know what type of person I'm supposed to be here when I review this. Am I supposed to be the CEO of a, of a finance company, et cetera? Okay. Um, newsletters. Thank you. I just issued my first newsletter this week. Yeah. Schools. Cool. Okay. I don't see any politicians. Excellent. All right. Bottoms up. Okay. You need more skills. Okay. And I want you to get your friends or people you work with to like your skills, right? Like theirs. I like yours. 
Okay. And you want to sort these skills based on what you want to sell yourself more as. So if you want to work in finance, you drag this up here. Okay. Cool. Um, add a little bit more detail here on this bachelor's you got. Okay. Maybe clubs you remember of, et cetera. Uh, experience, um, you need to add a ton more details here. Uh, and if you're in my, my platinum program, I, I, I write your LinkedIn profile myself. We're, we're sold out for this year's platinum. Next one will be next year. Um, okay. And in the first semester of, of my, my silver MBA, I tell you how to do a great LinkedIn profile as, as well. Um, I would start posting more on whatever it is you're most passionate about. Okay. Um, and then this this has to read like you're giving it, you're about to give a keynote speech. Okay. So let's say you're about to give a keynote speech at a conference and somebody says to you, do you have a bio? I want you to write it here in the third person. I like the parallel construction here. No more than three sentences per paragraph. Looks good to me. Okay. And then this is the most search field up here to one. So whatever industry it is you want to work in, you put those right here. Okay. Uh, and I would change this as well. The text might not show up that well on mobile. And also, uh, instead of your face, I would I'd just have a, an image that is is, is something that is going to motivate you, motivate, inspire people. I'll show you examples. So this is uh, one of my students in Italy. Uh, he got a job. Uh, he was in my platinum program last year. He got a job working um, in, in M&A, actually. Uh, so you want to have something like this. And he wanted to work in Zurich. That's Zurich Financial Markets there. Another student of mine you can use as an example, do a search uh, for Dr. Dion Vernon. Uh, she, she's great. I met her in person at graduation a couple of years ago here. Use three layer pictures always if you can. Uh, and I got that from uh, uh, Adobe stock images. Um, and then you can just uh, read, read her profile here. It's fantastic. Okay. And it's really inspiring too. The first sentence has got to be inspiring. I'll read this quickly. And I'll move on. Dr. Dion Vernon's career and education has always been at the intersection of the liberal arts and sciences. In addition to working for Olympic Committee globally, she has extensive experience on Broadway with more than 10 productions, including The Lion King, Hamilton, Cats, and Chicago. And I asked her if she, she worked on Less Miserables, and she said no. Yeah. So anyway, th those, are, those are a couple tips for you. Yeah. All right. Thank you for sharing. All right. Um, uh, and then Ralph wrote, uh, do, do, we have to, um, do we have to be on Zoom uh, for gold uh, MBA uh, every class? No, you don't. No. There's no attendance. I don't. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, and then uh, Durs wrote, what do you think about the lithium industry? I'm bullish longer term only because I'm bullish on alternative energy and battery powered cars. Yeah. Yeah. And you can just do a search on rare earth or rare minerals for more details. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and whenever I look at an investment, I always ask myself this one question. You know, in five years, will this company or this sector be more relevant or less relevant than it is today? So I know in five years, battery powered cars and lithium will be more relevant than they are today. Okay. Moving on to Priscilla, uh, who wrote, uh, hey, Chris, hey, what certifications would give me an edge as a credit analyst in the United Kingdom? I have more than five years in job experience in banking without a finance degree. Uh, have your courses, I have your courses though. Yeah, thanks. Look, I think the most important thing you can do in business by far is, is, is network. Right. And, and they don't teach you that in school. But I really do believe that if you set up enough informational meetings using what I teach in my courses and in this free book, you will get the job of your dreams. Now, and if you want, just go to my website. You, you guys know the link to downloads for free. But um, whenever you see a job opening online, you literally have a one in 250 chance of getting that job. So who gets that job? It's almost always somebody that knows someone at the company. So these are the new rules. So how do you meet people at companies? Well, you make sure your LinkedIn profile is up to date and you send in-mails. You send in-mails to people that work at companies you want to work at and you ask for an informational meeting by highlighting one or two things you have in common with them. You don't say why you want to meet though. Now my success rate on getting meetings with people I've never met before using LinkedIn, using that methodology is 95%. And I don't say that to impress you, rather, I say it to impress upon you the fact that you can do it and anybody can do it. You know, networking is like dating. You just have to ask a lot. And just remember, you only have to be right in business one time. So if you set up 30 or 40 or 50 meetings with somebody that works at, I don't know, Lazard Frères that has a, an, an office there in, in Canary Wharf in the United Kingdom, you will get a job eventually. Yeah. 
Okay. And that's why my MBA program, on the very first day, we start off with how to network on steroids. Yeah. But you can just read that book if you want to as well, if you don't want to watch the, the MBA class. All right. Um, you know what I would say, though? Um, I would say if you want to get some sort of a designation, um, what I would probably do is get the CFA. It's a three-year course, right? And you just, you don't attend classes, you just write three exams. Um, there's level one, two, and three. Yeah. And if you have more questions about that, I, I can tell you more about it too. Okay, Radu mentioned, when you mentioned Python, uh, and, and by the way, when I mentioned Python, it's, it's Luca Anison. So Luca, he, he has the force. Yeah, he's going to be amazing. Yeah. Okay. When you mentioned Python, I remember about Mojo. Uh, did you see the new language that's more or less like Python++ that will enable high throughout per, throughput uh, and performance might change the game for programming? Yeah. Luca, what do you think? Yeah. Luca, if you're still in the call, brother. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Irwan, God bless you. Thank you for that, 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 that rupee donation. Appreciate it. That will go directly to Project Magoo, um, uh, which, which is where I'm building schools. I'm going to be in Rwanda again uh, this summer at the same school. Everybody, please say a prayer for Vital, okay? Who 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 is my my co-founder in that that school? Yeah. Okay. Um, next question is: What do you think about the CFA certificate in finance? Is it worth it? I, I think it's helpful. I do. Now, should you get an MBA or a graduate degree and spend a hundred grand on, on on getting a degree? So, and I'm not going to pitch my stuff here. I'm just going to tell it like it is. I would only spend a lot of money on university. If you've set up a hundred networking meetings using the stuff I teach you, and you still can't get that coveted job. I promise you, if you set up a hundred networking meetings in an industry you want to work in, you will get that job. But you got to follow through. And I say with love in my heart, I can take you to the water, but I can't force you to drink. And if you think a hundred meetings is too much, ask yourself, how badly do you want that job or career change? Okay. Next up, uh, Prashant. Uh, love you, Prashant. Wrote, uh, apart from gold, uh, what's your opinion about silver as an investment opportunity uh, in the long run? Yeah. So when the economy is not doing as well, silver doesn't do as well because there's lots of industrial applications for silver. So regardless of how the economy is doing, I think gold is a fantastic investment. Silver is much more cyclical. So you want to buy cyclical stocks like Caterpillar, Caterpillar, ticker CAT, and silver, ticker SLV, that's ETF. You want to buy cyclical stocks and cyclical commodities when it's when things are awful and people think, oh my God, the world is ending and they're losing lots of money. It's companies like CAT, at least. Never buy cyclical companies like Caterpillar, et cetera, when the PE is low. You buy them when the PE is astronomically high or doesn't exist because it means they're getting close to the bottom of the economic cycle. Yeah. I know it's a different way to think. Okay, moving on to uh, a secret tuber. Give me one second here, guys. Here we go. All right, secret tuber wrote, uh, Hi, Chris. Uh, I have a, a sweets shop in India. Cool. Uh, it was set up by my father. It's not performing well. Uh, what are your opinions on it? Uh, what steps should I take to grow from here? Uh, and how do you beat other sweet shops? Oh, I love that question. Yeah, yeah. So first of all, I would write a thorough business plan. You know, failing to plan is planning to fail. Uh, never start a company without writing a business plan. And if you want to think about how to take your company to the next level, write a business plan as well. Now, in my MBA program, in the third semester, I have a venture capital boot camp where I teach you how to write a business plan. I ask you seven or 800 questions. You answer them. And then I teach you how to raise money as well. And I teach you your go-to-market strategy, how to analyze the competition and much, much more. So I recommend that you write the business plan. You can take my course or just search for a business plan online, but complete a thorough business plan first. Because it's hard for me just to answer this uh, without knowing much more about your business. Yeah. If you want to disclose more about your business, like your website, etc., I'm happy to take a quick look right now and give you my humble thoughts. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, and then do you sell online? If not, maybe that's something to look at as well. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, next up, Omron wrote, um, what do you think about prop trading firms uh, in Forex, proprietary trading, meaning the, the, the firm's capital? No, don't do it, please. And I say this with love my heart as always. Um, the reason that, you know, currencies go up or down on a daily basis is because of geopolitical statements that are out of our control. 
Now, earlier in this call, the Berlin from San Bernardino, California, mentioned that the wording changed in the Federal Reserve minutes to something like, we're mildly concerned now about inflation or, or the, the economy or recession. You can't forecast that. You know, on a daily basis, we get fooled by randomness. You know, stocks and, and currencies go up and down in the near term because of random stuff that's announced. I don't know what Beijing is going to say tomorrow. I don't know what Putin is going to say the next day about oil. I have no idea what Saudi is going to say from a saber rattling perspective. I don't know if other countries are going to team up, uh, which is what already happened with uh, South Africa, uh, Saudi, uh, uh, Russia, and China, and doing military operations in, 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 you know, in the South Pacific, which is happening right now. I don't know. We can't forecast that stuff. I want you to always be long-term focused, always. You know, Warren Buffett, whenever he buys a stock, he assumes that the market's going to be closed for at least 10 years. Now, obviously, it won't be closed, but you have to be long-term focused because, as Buffett said, the longer the view, the wiser the intention. Now, if you had bought Coca-Cola day one when it went public in like 1919 or whatever it was, a year later, you'd be down 50%. You got to think longer term. If you hold on to it longer term, you'll, you'll make a fortune. Obviously, do your own due diligence, which is what I teach you in my MBA program. But Buffett has owned this since 1988, and he said he's never, ever, ever, ever sell it. Always be long-term focused. The only reason you should ever look at technical analysis is after you've looked at valuation and fundamentals. Then you look at technical analysis to help you decide if a stock is oversold, then buy, or if it's uh, massively overbought and has passed your target price, maybe take some profits. But always think long-term. And even the best hedge funds in the world, they think like that. They think three to five years out. Day trading does not work. I promise you. Okay. All right. Uh, next up, Prashant wrote, uh, India loves you too, Christopher. Thank you. God bless you. And thank you for, for, for the emoji. Yeah. I love dosa. For those of you that go to Indian, Indian restaurants in America or anywhere in the world, all the food's amazing. I love it. But you have to ask for dosa. Once you try dosa, everything changes. It's the best food you'll ever eat. It's like the first time I tried a Krispy Kreme donut uh, in New York City, fresh out of the oven. But dosa is 10 times better. Okay. Um, uh, and then Ralph, uh, uh, oh, uh, next up, sorry, Manas wrote, um, and if I miss a question, just paste it again. Uh, Manas wrote, um, why is Japan growing despite negative rates? Uh, why is that and how come, it, and, and will it be longer term? Yeah, so you gotta be careful about looking at year-over-year -year growth for any company or any economy because it's all based on year-over-year -year comps. So last year was, was tough for Japan, so was the year before, right? And so it's just a dead cat bounce, I think. And I love Japan. And one, one of the first deals I, I, I worked on, actually, I, I worked at Goldman Sachs. I was a grunt, was NTT Dokubo, which is the biggest IPO in the world in 1988, ticker 9432. Yeah. And, and I love Japan. I love it. I've done a hell of a lot of research on the economy. And what's terrifying, well, what's happening in Japan right now breaks my heart. What's terrifying is that right now the population is roughly 130 million. By 2050, it's going to be 80 million. You know, people are not getting married. They're not having kids anymore. It's terrifying. Really, really scary. Yeah. And they haven't really been able to grow their economy much uh, since the Nikkei peaked in the early 1990s. Yeah. Hats off to Nintendo for passing a billion dollars uh, in sales for their movie. It's awesome. I love Nintendo. And by the way, when you think about your social media strategies, think about Nintendo by repurposing your content. Nintendo has taken their 8-bit, 16-bit, and 64-bit games and repurposed them on the Switch. Do the same thing. I do that every week with this weekly call. The seven best questions become vlogs, or they go onto LinkedIn, or they go onto my TikToks. Yeah, repurpose. Okay. Ralph wrote, uh, is all this information in the MBA course? Yeah, and, and a lot more too, yeah. Uh, the MBA, of course, is hundreds and hundreds of hours. We keep adding more stuff as well. Uh, I'm partnering with, with Luca Anderson as well. Um, uh, and may the 4th be with you, Luca. Yeah, May 4th. Uh, to, to put a lot of tech stuff in the program. I'm excited. Excited to meet you, Luca. Okay, uh, next up, Manas wrote, uh, China has been buying less U.S. debt and more gold and Bitcoin recently. Yeah, yeah. That's why I've, I've become more bullish on cryptos and gold um, not too long ago. Uh, and then you wrote, and also political conditions in the U.S. are getting uh, to newer ways. Crypto mining will have 30% tax now. 
Um, so how did China, an agrarian economy 60 years ago, uh, become competitive for the U.S. in a short amount of time? Like, it's crazy to even think about that. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So w when I was a baby, uh, Richard Nixon, who took the United States off, off, off the gold standard, uh, Richard Nixon, who said, I'm not a criminal, <laughs> he visited China. Uh, and since then, the, the Chinese market's been opening up. And my friends that have grown up in China, they say that the Chinese government always says, we'll have small changes every year and big changes every three years. Now, the Chinese government is so long-term focused. And some people say that uh, Chinese communists, uh, meaning government, are the best capitalists. Now, what the Chinese government is doing is they're starting to build up their, um, their, their domestic economy so they're not as reliant on the U.S. Okay, now, if a trade war were to start, China would be hurt more than the U.S. Obviously, everybody would be hurt. But I think in China, there might be, you know, might, you know more uprisings, whatever. Hopefully, very, very, very peaceful. Uh, but they're much more reliant on the U.S. than vice versa. So they have no choice but to export to America and no choice but to buy our debt or American debt. I'm a global citizen, Canadian, but I live in America. So they did it slowly over time. It wasn't overnight. Yeah. And since the beginning of time, well, a thousand years, whatever, everybody's been trying to get into China. Everybody, you know, the, the, the British, every single economy, you know, doing it through Hong Kong, which was like the best portal investment ever. But the new Hong Kong is Singapore. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then he wrote, uh, here in India, uh, rates are six and a half percent. And still, uh, we're growing more and more. Yeah, no, India is, is, is kicking ass. They're, pardon me, doing very well. Um, you know, India does not have an inverted yield curve like America. It has a normal yield curve because people are bullish on the future of India. And India in the past year has increased their year-over-year -year trade with Russia by 400%. So India is, uh, will be the biggest economy in the world at some point. Um, all right. Uh, uh, next up, uh, Caroline, who's from France, but lives in Ontario, Canada, wrote, good morning, Chris. Uh, hope, hope you're doing well. I'll see you in the silver Zoom call in an hour. Awesome. Good, good to see you. All right. And Dewan Rent, uh, be my mentor. Um, sure. Ask me humbly, you know, when one, when one teaches to learn. So ask me questions whenever you want on this weekly webcast. And for those of you that, that don't have mentors uh, that work at big companies, please find at least one or two Yodas at your company to mentor you. Ask them, they will say yes, and you know, they'll, they'll pleasantly say yes. They'll, they'll be happy and honored to do it. And I want you all to mentor other people as well, because again, when one teaches, two learn. And it also reinforces what your personal blueprint for success is. Okay. Ralph, how are you? Good to see you. Okay, moving on to, to Daniel Dick. Who, uh, da Dan is actually uh, from uh, Fresno, California. Um, uh, he went to Stanford, right? I think you have a couple of degrees from Stanford. He's in my MBA program, my platinum program now. Used to work at Oracle as well. He, he's a great guy. Yeah. Um, uh, and then Dan wrote, that's so cool that you're doing the, the tech course. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's good. A lot of it is going to be partnering with, with, with Luca. Yeah. And again, may the fourth be with you, Luca. Yeah. Okay. I should have worn Star Wars thing today, man. If you watch baseball games tonight, you'll see tons of people wearing Star Wars stuff. Uh, and then Dan wrote, yikes, my wife and I are both very outspoken in politics. Uh, ouch, you wrote ouch there. Yeah, yeah. I just make sure that you don't follow any politicians um, on, on Twitter or, or, or LinkedIn. Yeah. And then he wrote, I have to leave to take my son to school. God bless you and see you later. God bless you too. I'll see you at 1120 today, man. Thanks. Okay, moving on to Bakari who wrote, good morning, everyone. Hi, Chris. Hey, I hope all is well. Likewise. What are your thoughts about green and renewable energy stock investments? I wish to stay in the weekly live, but I have to leave. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So what, what happened in 2008 was a lot of solar companies went belly up. Um, and, and the reason it happened is because the only reason certain green tech companies existed was because of, of massive government subsidies. Like in Spain, for example, there were huge subsidies in solar. Uh, and then when push came to shove and the global economy was within 24 hours of bank machines not working the government in Spain got rid of those subsidies. So if you're going to invest in clean tech, make sure these companies can stand their own two feet and make sure that they're not just reliant on government uh, a donation, so to speak, or government support, right? Um, it's, it's interesting because I, I read this book by Michael Porter, um, who 
he's a Harvard Business School professor. He, he came up with the five forces model. He wrote this book in 2002 called Can Japan Compete? And, or maybe it's 2000. And the crux of that book is fascinating. He said, and of course, Japan can compete. Um, but what happened was after World War II, the Japanese economy was in shambles, of course. And the Japanese government created uh, a lot of incentive programs to build up the Japanese economy in the 1940s after World War II. And they gave incentives to, incentives to every sector of the economy except for two, consumer electronics and autos. And lo and behold, many years later, decades and decades later, the, the two most successful industries in Japan are autos and consumer electronics. So I think that too much government, it's, it's kind of like giving a kid an allowance, you know, when they're in their 40s. <laughs> you gotta let them stand on their own two feet. Yeah, and, and Darwinism works. Okay. Oh, Esten, how are you? Oh my gosh, it's been, it's been so long, man. I, I hope you're doing well, brother. Uh, uh, Excellent. Uh, Esten used to, used to know, it was Aubrey McLennan, the founder of, of, of Chesapeake. Uh, it's great to see you, man. And, and I hope your baby is doing well. Last time I, I met you and your wonderful wife, uh, you were expecting. Uh, great to see you, man. I hope you can make it up for graduation this year on August 12th and 13th. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Esten, uh, you warm my heart, brother. He wrote, uh, uh, good morning, Chris. Uh, when I was in your class, we often referenced Andy Grove's Only the Paranoid Survive for various topics. Are you concerned with continuing bank failures? Did QE uh, wreck us? Yeah, yeah. And, and I still have that microchip from the cover of that book, Only the Paranoid Survive. Uh, and the crux of that book uh, was basically uh, Intel um, uh, almost went bankrupt a couple of times. One time was in the early uh, 80s when they were competing against Japanese companies selling DRAM. And that was a strategic inflection point for them. They had to get out of that market and make processors. And on the cover of the book, you've got Andy Grove holding this exact chip here, right? This model from 1994 when Intel had a Pentium float issue. So this chip here was a disaster for, for Intel, but it turned out to be gold and here's why. So in 1994, Intel released this chip here, the Pentium. And they realized that if you did advanced calculations with a gazillion decimal points, you'll be off a little bit. Right, which can really it can be really costly and, and can lead to loss of life as well in healthcare companies making drugs, etc. So what he did was this. Dr. Andy Groff, God bless me, passed away recently. What he did was he went on all the talk shows and he owned up to it. And he said, We're very sorry. And my name is, is Andy Groff. I'm the CEO of, of Intel. Uh, we have a problem with this chip. And anybody out there, corporation, you know, government or individual that wants to get their money back or have us send them a new chip, please contact us. We'll do it. And you think, oh my God, the stock is going to crash. It's going to be awful. But transparency builds trust. And the unanticipated positive byproduct, byproduct of, of those interviews on Report on Business News in Canada, CNBC, et cetera, was that people are like, hey, this guy seems kind of, he seems ethical and trustworthy. And what is that thing? I, I've never seen it before. So he was able to brand a product that you don't see, feel, or touch. It was genius. It was absolutely genius crisis management. And then what Intel did after then was they went on this massive marketing campaign. And every time you heard the Intel jingle duh, 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 in commercials, Intel paid 40% of those commercials for all PC companies. Anyway, your question is, sorry, are you concerned with, with bank failures? Uh, did QE uh, wreck us? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, QE has had a big problem. I mean, there, there's, there's, there's only so much you can cut rates. Once you flood the market uh, with, with money and you cut rates and there's no more money left, this is fake money, and rates are zero, what do you do next? It's disastrous. And it created a massive bubble and it created inflation. And hindsight's 2020. And yes, the government had to do that because nobody knew it was going to happen with, with, the, with, with COVID. But what should have happened before, and, and I fault Democrats and Republicans, bipartisan comment, is when times were good in 2010 and onwards, they should have raised interest rates a lot. Because if you don't raise rates uh, a lot, then you can't cut rates to stimulate the economy. And you're out of bullets. What do you do next? Yeah. So QE was, was damaging uh, in hindsight. Yeah. And it's not fair to us either, man. You know, we, we work so hard to make money and, you know, the, the government devalues it a lot. It's, just, it's not fair. Uh, that's why cash is trash. And you always got to put your money in, in alternative asset classes. Now, things got so bad in 2008 
when they couldn't cut rates anymore, really. What they did was, you know, desperate times call for desperate measures. In September of 2008, the United States government made it illegal to short 800 stocks. And what they also did was they came up with these crazy programs like cash for clunkers, where the U.S. government would buy your car to put cash in your pocket. It was crazy. Yeah. So I always believe in raising interest rates, you know, 25 to 50 basis points at every quarter or so when times are good. So you can be long term focused. The longer the view, the wiser the intention. Okay, uh, Duan wrote, uh, since the earlier question gets stripped out, uh, I love your financial analyst course, uh, especially the first part about macroeconomics. Uh, do you have any other course materials on macroeconomics? I, I do in my MBA program. There's a track in the MBA program called EMS, which stands for Economics Management and Strategy, where I teach a lot about fiscal policy, monetary policy, and much more. Yeah, but no theory. No, you'll never see me explain supply and demand graphs because nobody uses that in the real world, unless you're like an economist. Okay. Uh, and then Eston wrote, uh, P.S., uh, hope you've been well. Missing you in our class uh, Zoom calls. Uh, it's so good to see. Dude, come on the Zoom this week if you want to. You're, you, your grandfather in forever, right? So uh, at 11.20, if, if you have time. Yeah, I think you're two hours ahead of me. Yeah, So I'll be 1.20 your time. Yeah. Great to see you, man. Okay. All right. Uh, give me one second here. All right, next up, we have uh, Susan from St. Louis. I uh, wrote, good morning, Chris. Please elaborate on the three-year CFA. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So the CFA, it stands for Certified Financial Analyst Designation. It takes you three years to get it. Um, basically, what happens is you write one exam each year for three years. And they recommend buying $1,000 worth of textbooks. Don't do that. Instead, buy the, the summary books from a company called Schweizer, okay, and buy them on eBay for 30 bucks. And it teaches you a lot of stuff about finance. I think it's more reputable than other finance designations. Yeah. yeah. Plus, you don't have to stop working. Yeah. All right. Uh, and then Luca wrote, uh, definitely a valuable thing to have our eyes on. Uh, by the way, if you're interested in performance, I would explore Go and or Rust. Okay, Rust is the program. Yeah, yeah. Amazing uh, languages that provide uh, extrapolated ex extra performance layers for your uh, uh, ML, which is machine learning and, and, uh, and, and AI. Yeah, and what, what Luke and I are gonna be doing when he comes here is we're gonna be filming uh, our, our AI course, AI stuff. So within AI, you've got machine learning. And within machine learning, there's tons of technologies we're gonna be teaching. I'm gonna teach you machine learning, not just in Excel, but we're also gonna use IBM's, IBM's computers, which you can use for free online, and many other resources uh, as well, yeah. And in one of the case studies, we're actually going to use AI to recognize beetles as part of this Russian doll process. These props will make a lot more sense later when, once you see them. What we're also doing is um, I've got a case study I'm actually working hard on now on this company here use, using AI. Bonus points to anybody that tells me what this is from. So what we're doing is there's a big hedge fund called Renaissance Technologies. And Renaissance Technologies has had an 80, or had, pardon me, has had over a 60% return on a gross basis every year on average since the 1980s. It's unbelievable. No one comes close. And Renaissance uh, uses a lot of machine learning, which I'm going to teach you in Excel and in other technology platforms with the help of, of Luca. So Renaissance, uh, uh, what they do is they look at, they have thousands of Linux servers running in parallel that pick stocks. For example, and this is where, uh, uh, where Pollo Loco comes into, uh, into context here. For example, if it rains a lot, then Renaissance might, their algorithm from a machine learning perspective, might, might short restaurant stocks because when it's raining a lot, fewer people go out to eat. And so the case study that we're working on together that Luca and I are gonna be filming in early June in my studio here, the case study is we're looking at uh, uh, linear regression and regression analysis and machine learning in Excel for when it rains, what is the impact on sales for, for Los, whatever this company is called from the show you guys know. Yeah. It, it, anyway, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I love teaching. Okay. Um, next up, uh, uh, Will. Hey, Will. How are you, man? It's been a while. Will wrote, uh, what is the best way to promote a science fiction book uh, for self-published authors? Yeah, yeah. So I, I recommend, um, so, so, so what I did, and I recommend everybody do this as well, 
is write one chapter per week of a book, okay, on whatever it is you're passionate about business-wise, for example. And then every week for two years, that's 104 weeks, put an article on LinkedIn. And whatever articles perform the best in terms of clicks, likes, commentary, et cetera, make those articles first in your book. And that's what I did right here with, with my book. And that's a way to repurpose your content, kind of like Nintendo repurposes 8-bit, 16-bit, 64-bit content on the Switch. And the way to write a book is to go here to this website. I'm going to give you a link. I don't ask for your email or anything. You can download my, my template. Go to haroonmba.com slash write book, all lowercase, write dash book. And you can just download this template here. All you have to know how to do is use Microsoft Word. That's it. Yeah. Anyway, you guys can open the template. On the first page are instructions on how to publish your book for free uh, on Amazon Print, Amazon Kindle, and ACX, which is Audible. Yeah. So I want you to start repurposing your science fiction book, uh, perhaps uh, in the form of vlogs uh, on YouTube, or it might be better suited also for TikTok. Yeah. Just summaries of each chapter. And if you're not sure how to create a quick summary that's engaging of each chapter, just copy the chapter, go to ChatGPT, and write exactly this. Write a 100-word summary of, and then paste the chapter. And right away, ChatGPT will create a 100-word summary that you can use as your script for your TikTok, for example. Okay. All right, next question is, how do I determine a business plan is a good plan? The way you know a business plan is a good plan is if you finish the business plan. A lot of business plans I've started writing in the past, I never finished. Because I realized, oh my God, it's not a good plan. Because maybe the market size is too small, uh, maybe it's too competitive, uh, that sort of thing. But high barriers to entry. Yeah, yeah. And in my MBA degree program, uh, I provide you with uh, like 800 questions uh, as part of the business plan venture capital bootcamp. And after you start answering those questions, you might realize, oh my God, this, this is not a good company to start. You'll know it's a good company if you think through all the issues and you complete the business plan. Yeah. Your chances of success go up a lot because of that. Yeah. And it's ridiculous because it's the most important decision a lot of people will make or one of the most important decisions in their life. Um, and, and if you don't start a business the right way, you know, it can bankrupt you, it can destroy your health, your wealth, uh, your relationship with loved ones. So failing to plan is planning to fail. Always write that business plan first. And even if your company is up and running now, if you don't have a business plan, please go write one. It helps a lot, especially the financial analysis side, which I teach, because without data, it's an opinion and nothing more. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, cool. Uh, and then uh, Mamadou wrote, uh, is this the best time to buy stocks? And then you wrote impossible time markets in order to, to hold long-term things. Yeah. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. It's The market can stay irrational on the upside and downside longer than we can stay solvent. So I believe in dollar cost averaging. You know, what, what I believe is every time you get money uh, in your account, in your paycheck every two weeks, have it taken out and put into your favorite stocks or ETFs into your retirement savings program, for example. So it's out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. And Warren Buffett said, um, you got to spend what is left after saving instead of saving what is left after spending. Okay. All right. Moving on to Secret Tuber, who wrote, um, how do you make people come to my shop? Uh, I know how to sell, but if people are not coming, how can I sell? I have a sweet shop uh, in, in India. Yeah. <sighs> Maybe, and I'm just going to think out loud here. Um, I don't know much about your company. Maybe you can have a loyalty program, uh, like, like a card, for example, so that, um, you know, whenever somebody buys, you, you punch a hole in it or you put a stamp and when they buy 10, they get 20% off or whatever it is. What you can also do is you could think about, and this is out there, a subscription-based service where people can subscribe to your to certain suites uh, in your shop and you can deliver it to them directly uh, on the internet if you want, kind of like what Amazon does with subscribe and, uh, and save. Yeah. yeah, that might help with revenue visibility uh, as well. Yeah, but there's a ton of other marketing things you can do as well, which I teach in my MBA program in a lot of detail. And if you're not on social media, please start because YouTube is the biggest gold rush in history and it's the only gold rush that costs you nothing to make the product and it's the only gold rush where you can get access to billions of potential customers right away for free. And I think we're all going to look back decades from now and say, damn it, 
I wish I created more YouTube content because each video you make is like, it, it's like a little franchise that makes money. Yeah. Okay. Also ask your customer, do surveys. Ask the customer what they want. Ask the customer why they buy and why they don't buy. Yeah. And in my, the, the business plan portion of my MBA degree program in the third semester, I go into a lot more detail than that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, next up is, okay. Uh, all right. Next up, uh, Paolo Burgos uh, wrote, uh, hi, Chris. Um, hey, what's your long-term focus on stocks? Uh, as the market is a crazy spiral, uh, with the regional banks collapsing, thanks. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, I just know that, you know, the, the S&P will be higher, you know, several decades from now. You know, the historical return on the S&P 500 is 10.5%. Of course, there's down years and up years. Cash is trash. I think it's a sound investment. Because again, I think the last economy to go belly up would be the US government. Yeah. Now, the best time to back up the truck and buy a lot, meaning buy a lot of shares, is when everybody is freaking out. And you can monitor what's called the VIX. It's a volatility index I've talked about it before. I can go there again if you want me to. But if and when the VIX goes above 70 or 80, and it happens maybe once a decade, that's the time to buy. And when it does, you're gonna feel like the world is ending. And you're gonna say, I'm crazy to buy now. That's when you need to buy because nobody else is. You gotta be greedy when others are fearful and vice versa. People get emotional about stocks. And, and that's why unemotional people tend to do extraordinarily well uh, in business. You know, never celebrate success too much because of vice versa. Things got so crazy in March of 2020 that the price of oil went to negative $20 temporarily. Crazy. That's when you buy, when there's blood in the streets. Yeah, so, and the reason, by the way, it went to negative $20 People justified it. I don't think it's justifiable, but because there were tankers in the Baltic Sea that cost $600,000 a day to just sit there containing oil. Therefore, the price of oil was negative. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mamadou wrote, uh, Chris, I hope you watched The Mandalorian uh, Season 3. Uh, I'm a couple episodes into it. Thanks. Um, if you haven't already watched uh, Pedro Pascal, who's the main actor there, if you haven't already watched um, his, uh, when he hosts his Saturday Night Live, please watch it. It's the funniest Saturday Night Live I've ever seen. Um, he does this, this great take on the, on the Mario movie. It's, it's, it's funny. Just ch check it out. You, you, you'll love it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, Will wrote, um, uh, what is the best way to promote a science fiction? Okay. I already answered that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, all right, next up, Manas wrote, um, uh, how will Bitcoin be regulated unless it's taxed because no one owns it and everybody own, owns it. So who will appear before Congress to testify? It's funny, but taxing crypto it is a problem. Yeah, well, they'll do it through the big exchanges, right? So, you know, the, the IRS, you know, for years has been monitoring uh, Coinbase, for example. Um, and if you want to learn more about taxes and Coinbase and the IRS, just do a search on my name and NBC interview on YouTube. I did an interview, or pardon me, on on. I did an interview on NBC years ago uh, on that very topic. But I think regulation is a good thing because the opposite of regulation is making it illegal. Yeah. Okay, Mohammed uh, wrote here, I'm stuck between the following. Sure. Number one, complete the SEMA in a year. I, I don't know what SEMA is. I'm so sorry. If you want to explain what that is, I, I can help you out with that. Thanks. Or give you my humble thoughts. Yeah. Okay. But whatever it is you want to do, what I want you to do is just go to LinkedIn and find people that are living your dream life or have your dream job right now and see what they have experience-wise or education-wise. Yeah. And then you can fill that gap. Okay, uh, next question is, will American elections change fate of global power? Because as what I see, it's blaming the other guys. Banks are failing. Uh, and, and Magellan, vice president, said 400 banks uh, failed in 08. Uh, what, what the bleep was was that yeah I, I i don't know much about that that interview yeah but a lot of banks went belly up more so in 08 things were way worse in 08 they are right now yeah i don't think people should be panicking but i hope there's panic so i can start buying yeah yeah peter lynch yeah he headed up the magellan fund of fidelity years ago yeah yeah 
but there, there is concern out there. I have a lot of friends that work at hedge funds. I, I get texts all the time. They send me charts of, oh my God, the world is ending and all that stuff. And yeah. All right. Um, all right. Abdur wrote, uh, I'm from India and I'm starting a youth marketing agency. What are the documents I should prepare uh, with the client uh, dealing? Yeah. Yeah. So w whenever it comes to documentation and clients, uh, what I would do is talk to a lawyer. So what you can do is do a search for this. What is the legal Zoom equivalent in India? Yeah. And whenever you're, you're raising money or dealing with customers, whether you're, you're going public or, or raising money for, for a startup, whatever it is, you have to have lawyers create the investment offering memorandum and all the legal documents and make sure, of course, that your business is registered because when you're way more successful than you already are, people will come after you. That's how you know you've made it when people come after you and they will. The only lawyers I like, I like, aside from civil rights lawyers, are the ones that represent me. And I always wonder, are you a jerk before you go to law school or do they teach you that in law school? Yeah. All right. Um, and Manas wrote, thank you for everything, uh, my mentor. Uh, God bless you all forever and ever. Uh, one day I'll be there in your office uh, with you teaching on YouTube. Uh, uh, live with your, your permission humbly. And thank you for all the emojis and, and God bless you. And thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. All right. Oh, by the way, somebody asked me uh, about my earplugs for sleeping when I, I went to Stanford for a sleep study. So I, I went to my, my doctor and uh, I went to a specialist who recommended talk to a doctor first. They're called uh, West, West Stone. Okay. And what they do is they put silicon, some kind of mold in your ear, and they wait for it to dry in like a minute or so. Um, and then it comes out like this. They're kind of pricey, but, but it's worth it. Right. And, and these are perfectly customized uh, for my ear. Um, so you know, what I do is I, I put them in like, like this and you hear nothing. They're, they're amazing. Incredible. Yeah. Um, and then what I also do as part of the sleep study uh, and my sleep has been amazing lately, man. I feel like a million bucks. I monitor my sleep closely as well using my Ua ring. Uh, and last night, my sleep score was 87. The day before, it was 93 out of, out of 100 and all that stuff. And one of the things we found through the sleep study was that um, in the middle of the night, I don't know how, but I always take the earplugs out and I put them neatly. And I remember this very neatly on my side table. And so... A, a way to avoid this is as follows. And this is crazy, but I don't care. I want to help anybody that has issues like this. You put them in, okay? Especially if you have an important meeting the next day. You put them in, okay? I can hear nothing out of this ear. Then you get surgical tape, okay? Um, and uh, hold on a second. Here we go. Then what you do is you get surgical tape. Right? It's just, it's just tape and you tape it on your ear, or at least I have to, so that at night I don't take them out. And some people actually put this on their mouth. Don't do that. Some people put it on their mouth if they snore, which wakes up their, their spouse, yeah. So I get perfect sleep every night, and I have to do this. I know it's crazy, but I'm 100% transparent with all of you guys as well. Okay. I can't get it out. Oh, here we go. All right. Um, and then, uh, all right, next up, uh, uh, Ralph wrote, uh, I did start a business plan. Would you like me to, to send it to you? Yeah, I don't, I'm so sorry. I, I, I have 1.5 million students. It's hard for me to keep up. Uh, if you're in my, uh, one of my MBA programs, we can always talk about it, though. Yeah. Okay. And then Anurag wrote, uh, hey, Chris, uh, what is the relevance of a business plan? Uh, do all stars prepare one before starting a business in the real world? Uh, and at what stages of business? Yeah. So I would say the probability of a startup being much more successful is if they have a business plan. You know, you it's it's hard to raise money from a venture capital firm or high net worth investors with the, with the without at least some sort of documentation. You know, when I worked in venture capital, I invested in companies, and I was on boards of companies. I used to write literally, literally a 400-page due diligence report using my own customized methodology on the company. If you do enough research, you will do well in the long run, right? But you gotta, you gotta have some kind of a, a structure or, or a filter process. And in my MBA program, I provide you with all the tools that you need 
to be able to th figure out whether or not to invest in something. You'll notice I don't tell you what stocks to buy, right? Uh, or, or cryptos or anything. You know, I humbly believe, you know, if I give you a fish, you'll eat for a day. But if I humbly teach you how to fish, you'll, you'll eat for a lifetime. Okay, guys. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed this week's office hours. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I've got breaking news, uh, which I'm gonna play for you now, uh, and then I'll wrap it up and I'll see you guys next week. Breaking news, okay, this is, this is pretty serious stuff. Here it is here. Hello, my name is Bob Burgundy from Haroon. All right, the video certainly didn't work. I don't know why it sucks. Damn it. Okay. All right, so instead of ending with that, I'll end with the usual video that I end every week with, uh, which I licensed um, to Steve Jobs' uh, video, which is life-changing. God bless you all. I'll see you next week. And I'll play the breaking news uh, video next week. Thank you. Uh, please click like, subscribe, and all that good stuff. God bless you all. Thank you. When you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is, and your, your life is just to live your life inside the world, try not to bash into the walls too much, uh, uh, try to have a nice family life, uh, have fun, save a little money. Um, but life, th that's a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it. You can influence it. You can, you can build your own things that other people can use. And the minute that you understand that you can poke life and actually something will, you know, if you push in, something will pop out the other side, that you can, you can change it, you can mold it, um, that's maybe the most important thing, is to shake off this, uh, th this uh, erroneous notion that life is, is there and you're just going to live in it, versus embrace it, change it, improve it, make your mark upon it. Um, I, I think that's very important. And however you learn that, once you learn it, uh, you'll want to change life and make it better, because it's kind of messed up in a lot of ways. Um, once you learn that, you'll never be the same again.